<coughs> this uh, series of uh, lectures in this seminar, weekend seminar, will constitute a package of information on uh, God realization, will answer many questions that people have. Uh, those who are attending the entire seminar may like to reserve their questions to the end of the last session because they may find that the questions they are asking are being answered in the course of the seminar itself in subsequent lectures. However, if there is a question uh, which is blocking further grasp of the information that is being given, they are certainly most welcome to ask those questions at the end of each session. I am not uh, picking up the subject, they were not picked up by me anyway. The seminar was not structured or designed by me. This seminar has been designed by people here and uh, I will go along with the structure of the seminar as it has been provided to me and therefore it is not a chronological description nor a description from any particular set pattern. It will come as it comes. So have patience and hold on to what comes and see what unfolds for itself. The first subject is the secret path to God realization. The word secret is to be underlined in this title. Why is it secret? It is secret because there are several other paths which are not secret. God realization is realization of God. And God is everywhere. So when you realize anything, you have realized God. There are billions of ways of realizing God. Every time you have any experience, you are realizing God. Because God is everywhere. If it wasn't God, you wouldn't have any experience. God is manifest in every atom in every electron, in every piece of energy, in every particle of energy. And therefore, whatever you realize is God realization in that sense. But there's no secret about it. This is public, open realization of God. And we all realize, we may not call it God realization, but it is indeed God realization. But there are several paths which take us to a more intense, a deeper insight into why God has created the world as he has created, why we have to realize it in a particular way. And those paths are based upon either external practices or internal contemplation. Where there are external practices for God realization, then the system consists of a series of rituals. A lot of powers of God, which we cannot see in everyday life, become manifest when we perform those rituals go through those exercises which affect our mind and our psyche, which affect our consciousness, and we get to know certain powers emanating from us which are not ordinarily experienced by us, and therefore we say we are finding God in those special powers. We get powers of materializing things, we get power of telepathy, we get power of clairvoyance, we get several unusual powers, and we marvel where they come from, and they said, if these can exist, surely that is no ordinary law of nature. And therefore, we think we are realizing God. That is also God realization, because indeed those powers have been set up by God himself. And God manifests himself in those powers. There are many methods. Even to achieve those powers, there are hundreds of paths, hundreds of methods to reach those powers. There is no single path. There are several kinds of yogas in the Orient, they practiced. There are several psychic disciplines. There are several tantric and other witchcrafts which are practiced. There are several ways of controlling the mind. By mind control you can practice. There are several ways of thought control which can project these powers. There is a host of methods and means by which we can develop the power of the consciousness to have those experiences which are unnatural or supernatural. Each of these methods is claimed by its proponent to be the superior most method. Here I might mention that when I talk of these various paths to God realization, everybody who has found a path claims his path to be the superior most. It's a very odd thing that when I find people doing meditation for various purposes, each one says, my meditation is the highest, the best. It's the only way. When you find a person saying, my method is the only way you should become very suspicious of what he knows. Probably he knows very little. Because it is obvious that all paths are leading to realization of the same manifest God. How could it be the only way? In fact, all ways are ways of God realization. But there are different aspects of God that we realize through different methods. 
Then there are methods of God realization which is called self-realization. In that doctrine, the self is identified with God. And if we can find out who is our self, then we say we have found out who is God. Mostly that practice is associated with finding an image of oneself or experience of oneself different from the body experience of oneself. When one can see a form of oneself away from the body, a form of oneself that can look at this physical body and move away, do astral projections, we say having found that self which is not this body, we have had God realization. People claim that also to be self-realization equal to God realization. Then there is the doctrine that God is not in any form. So if you see him in any form, you are not seeing God. In that doctrine, it is claimed that God realization must be realizing God in his formless state, in which he has no form. But there again, when you have no form, what do you see? They say you don't see anything. You just become aware. The exponents of that path to God realization also claim that feeling the presence of God is God realization. When you feel the presence of God in whatever you are doing, it is God realization. It is. Because you wouldn't feel the presence if God wasn't there. That is also a path to God realization. If you feel God is with you in everything you are doing, indeed God is there with you in everything you are doing. I will later on in the course of this uh, statement that I am making now explain how God can fit in all these different paths and their definitions and still remain God and still remain the same one God because he fits in into all these ideas of God realization. So having the formless presence of God with us is also a form of God realization. Then there is a doctrine that God is light and therefore if there is more light you are closer to God. And that doctrine supposes that if you can have a practice, spiritual practice, a yogic practice, which takes your attention within and releases a lot of light, you are in the presence of God. And God is assumed to be a huge ball of light. And a small ball of light is our soul. And once the soul can experience that huge big mass of light, it has reached God. And when the little ball of light merges with the large mass of light, we have the soul has merged with God. Therefore, it is God realization. And if you, God is light indeed, God is light. Not only physical light, but light of knowledge, light of awareness. So if you do have the experience of merging with very strong, big, beautiful light, it is an experience of God realization. This is also a path to God realization. And all, and a lot of people follow this path. Then there is the doctrine that God is the word, one that can be listened to. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, what is the meaning of the word, Word, used there? It means that which can be listened to. Since light can be seen and not listened to, so we use the word, Word. And the exponents of the proposition that God is the Word, they say that God can be realized if you can listen to God, not if you can see God. You can see God in everything, but you realize God when you listen to God. And since we also listen to our mind, to listen to God it becomes difficult because we are never sure that the voice that comes within us is the voice of our mind or the voice of God. There are problems, but since mind is also created by God, therefore those who listen to the voice of conscience, the voice of the positive or good mind, also say we have heard the voice of God. And they are right. In terms of the good part of the mind working against the evil part of the mind, if you listen to the good part of the mind, the good part of your thoughts in the name of conscience, conscientious advice coming to us, then we are also listening to the voice of God and therefore that is also a form of God realization. But if you cannot find the distinction between the good and the bad voice of God and the mind tries to deceive you by giving you very evil instructions and say, carry them out because this is the voice of God. And the devil himself speaks in the name of the God and takes that form and swears by the scriptures. If that happens, then you can't accept any voice of the God. Those who say that all voices in the head are voices of the devil, whether it takes the form of God or if it's of the Satan, ignore all voices. And they say, in the beginning was the word means that God was the unspoken word, the word that is not spoken. 
that has no words to tell us a message, that the message comes from a sound which is not spoken, which is not formulated into a phonetic symbol like, like we have in our language. Therefore, they say God sounds like music. And therefore, music is the voice of God. Music is the unspoken voice of God without language. And that, therefore, should be listened to. And therefore, people are there trying to have God realization through the process of listening to the music of God and music of the spheres. Even in early Greek times, the music of the spheres was considered as the voice of God. And those who could listen to the music of the spheres were considered to have achieved God realization. I have described so many forms God realization for the simple reason that all are paths to God realization and God manifests himself in all these forms which people have realized. There is no need to criticize anybody, no need to quarrel with anybody. If somebody has realized God in that form, very good, accept it, it's beautiful, that person is happy. These are public paths to God, you can go on any of these paths. But apart from these public ways to God, there is a secret path to God. And the title of today's first lecture of the first session is The Secret Path to God Realization. Why is it secret? Because it is not known. It is kept concealed. Why is it kept concealed? Because God has kept himself concealed. If God made himself public, he would give a public way. In the other forms of God realization, to which I drew your attention, God has made himself manifest. And so God realization is not secret. When you see God in every leaf, in every stone, in every pebble, in every spot, in every bit of uh, matter, in every bit of energy, in every atom, when you see God in everything around you, you are seeing the public manifestation of God. There is nothing secret. God has not kept himself uh, hiding. And he is God in all these things. But when God hides himself, then he keeps the path to his hidden self as a secret path to God realization. When you want to find the God that is hiding and playing games with us with his manifestations, then you use the method of the secret path to God realization. So it is secret because God has become secret. God has concealed himself in some way. And that is why we want to find out in what form has he concealed himself in which he does not manifest. And we want to find him. Where is he hiding? Where is God hiding? If he was, wasn't hiding, we wouldn't have to find a secret path to go to him. But where is he hiding? If we knew where he is hiding, we would easily find him. We are looking for the secret God who is hiding in paths that are not so secret. If we go to an open place and look for God, then we are looking for the manifest form of God, not the secret hiding God, the one who is hiding. The hidden God, the concealed God who is not manifesting himself, who is behind all this show, who is the creator of everything, he must have kept a secret path to himself. And we are looking for the secret path. Of course, we have to first find where he is hiding. Now, if you find where God is hiding, you would be able to have some idea where to go and find him. Let us find the most difficult place where he can hide. Obviously, if he has a choice of hiding and becoming secret to us, he must have chosen the most confidential place, the most secret place where we cannot reach. Which is the most difficult place to search for? There is a deer called the musk deer that has lovely smell coming from the musk inside. And the deer smells it and says, what a wonderful musk. It must be coming from some part of the forest, some part of the path in which I am moving. And runs all over the path to find where the musk is coming from. We can't find it. Why? Because the very deer that is running to find the musk is carrying the musk with him. The musk is in him. And he's finding the musk by finding all the places. There is a story of the old lady who lost her little needle with which she was stitching. And she looked under the street light for that needle. A young man came by and said, Ma'am, what have you lost? Can I help you find it? She said, Yes, I've lost my little needle. I can't find it. I have to stitch something. And the man also started searching. He said, but ma'am, did you, did you know where you dropped it? She said, I dropped it in my house. He said, but why are you looking under the street light? She said, I have no light in my house. It's dark in there. You are looking for things where you can see light, not where it is hidden. If God has hidden himself, how can you find him where there is light? How can you find him where you think there is light? How can you find him outside? The question doesn't arise. 
Therefore, if God has hidden the best hiding place one can possibly imagine, contemplate, think of, realize is that he must have hidden himself right inside the finder, the seeker. So, seeker should go on seeking. God is hidden right where the seeker is moving. So, seeker goes along carrying God with him and he can't find him. The seeker cannot find God because he is carrying God with him. And since God is inside of the seeker, therefore, the seeker has no way. He thinks he is the seeker. So long as he is the seeker, how can God be in him? There is no such thing as inside a seeker. So he can't go inside. He is the seeker. He seeks. And he seeks all over. And he doesn't see God. He can't find God. Why? Because he is carrying the God not as a seeker, but in his seeking. The very seeking of God contains God. God hides inside the very experience of seeking him. Now, this is the most difficult place from where you can find him. If there was any corner, any spot where in this game of hide and seek, God was sure he couldn't be found, it would be this. To hide within the seeker, so seeker should go around seeking him. If he stops seeking, then the game is over. If he goes on seeking, he can't find. That's a lovely place for God to hide in. That's precisely where God is hiding. God the ultimate secret God, the God who has concealed himself, the God who from that concealed situation projects himself in all forms of manifestation, which I have called God-realization earlier, hides within the seeker. Therefore, to go within the seeker is a very secret path. It has never been made known. If it was made known, it wouldn't be a secret. Everybody would know. It cannot be made known because the moment you make, no, make it known, it no longer remains the path within the seeker. There is no way of describing it, but there is a way of realizing it. If the seeker were to look within himself, how can he look within himself? The seeker sometimes gets this intimation that God is within, I must seek him within. Then he says, what is within? And within becomes the body. And the seeker says, all right, I will go within this body and see if God is there. Then the seeker who is in search of the secret way to God realization closes his eyes because he doesn't want to look at the world outside. Stops listening, hides in a quiet place, in a very tranquil quiet place where there is no distraction, nothing to disturb him, closes his eyes and looks within. And what does he see when he does all this? He looks at the darkness, he looks at all the images, he looks at the friends who are angry with him, he looks at the people who are mad with him, he looks at the food he cooked and did not eat, he looks at all the things that he has left outside and come to seek God within. He looks at all the things that are outside of himself. He doesn't know how to look within. When you close your eyes and in a state of peace, meditation, in a quiet corner, go within, you are looking at all the things outside because they are the same things. You don't create any new thing. The only difference is, first you saw with your eyes open, now you are seeing them imaginatively and through memory. You are remembering those things. And surprisingly, the harder you try to see within, in the dark, quiet corner, the more the things come up in memory. Things you could not remember for years and tried hard to remember come up then at that time. To take you out exactly where you were before you started this meditation. You are given no opportunity to go within. The seeker, even in the most isolated place, alone, in the most intimate kind of meditation, remains outside of himself. And therefore, he cannot seek God within. God remains hidden while he is seeking. The only thing is, he thinks I am seeking outside, whereas he is seeking in the ideas outside and not outside of the, of the consciousness in the body. The seeker has closed his eyes, thinks it is a darkness inside. Do you know, with a little experiment, you can find out whether you are looking at the darkness inside? I will come to the question of how you can look within oneself. But before that, let me remove this misconception that when we are trying to sit in a state of meditation, in a state of being with ourselves, and when we close our eyes, we are seeing the darkness inside. That is not inside. Not inside the body either. That is outside. We are still trying to see with the same eyes. But we have closed them, therefore it is dark. When you think that this darkness is inside our head, you can perform an experiment of taking your hands up 
Work first with the eyes open and take them gradually to the eyes outside. Touch the eyelids and know how far the hands have to go to reach the eyes. When you have done that exercise, do it several times so that automatically you will stop at the point where the eyes come. Even if you want to do it here, you will stop where the eyes are. So your hands don't go beyond where the eyes are. Then you close your eyes after this practice and in the darkness you imagine you are inside. You visualize yourself sitting inside as a dummy, as a miniature. When you visualize your own picture, your own self in a miniature form in that darkness sitting in your head, then bring up the hands again to see that when you reach your eyelids, how much behind that image of yourself is left. When you will conduct this experiment, it will really surprise you. I have surprised almost all people who have done this. When you take your hands up and before you have reached the eyelids, you will have reached the image. And when you touch the eyelids, the image is still outside. You already crossed it. That image which you thought was inside the head was outside. You are making it outside. You do not know how to make any image inside. You can't. The darkness is outside. You are making images outside and you think that is the projection of the head going out. You don't know how to make any image inside the head. What looks like inside the head is outside. People spend years and years in meditation and get nothing out of it. They are all the time outside searching for something and calling it inside, believing it is inside and getting all confused. What's going on? It's not happening. Therefore, even the simple thing of going within the body is not possible. The secret part is secret. It is not that, that well known. It cannot be known. If somehow, imaginatively, you could go into the body, if you could withdraw your attention behind the body by imagining, there is a power of imagination. And imagination is a very strong power for the use of attention. In meditation, imagination is used as a very strong instrument. And imagination can create a lot of realities, which though from starting point look like imagined realities, turn out to be real realities because they are replaced by real reality. Imagination is a very good tool. Now, supposing you use imagination to say you are in the head behind the eyes and you imagine in this form that here are my ears on either side, here is my forehead in front, my hair are on top, my tongue, the nose is below this level of the eyes, the throat is below, this is the nape of the neck behind me. You imagine this is the house and inside that you are sitting in the middle. Imagination, pure imagination, because you can't get in otherwise. But if you imagine that you are in the center of that room, which is your head, and visualize the feeling, the consciousness of these parts, that means you close your eyes and feel where the ears are. You can feel the lobes of the ears because you are conscious of them. The attention is in the ears. So you feel where the ears are and see if you can center yourself between the two ears. Feel where the throat is. See if you can rise in levitation in the middle between the top of the head and the throat, right in the middle. See where the eyes and the back of the nape is. See if you can center yourself between these two points. If imaginatively you can feel all these things around you and you be there and you are there and you can watch all this happening, you will see you assume a form, a body there which is so big that it again creates the same problem of going within as this body. This body is either standing or sitting or doing something or as a, or as a torso or as a floating torso as a floating form and you are using a form to be there and that form has a size, a dimension and that you are in fact looking at the things around outside that dimension. If that consciousness has taken imaginatively the form of yourself in this head, even then you are outside of that form inside the head. Therefore, even then you have not gone within the seeker because who is the seeker? The seeker is the one who has imagined that he is there. Of course, if you begin to see yourself there, then of course that is not you. You is the one that is seeing yourself there. If in imagination you see yourself in a form in the middle of the head, then obviously that is not you. The one that is seeing that form is you. Where is that seeing? And you have to again push back. The problem is that every time you will imagine, use the power of imagination to come up to what you call within yourself, you will find a form of yourself out of which you are operating. You are again outside. If consciousness is just a dot, a perfect dot, 
with no dimension, how will you get inside? How can you get inside by imagination? Imagination fails to put you inside a perfect dot with no dimensions. Even that way cannot take you inside the seeker. Because the seeker is a ge geometrical, per geometrically perfect dot with no dimensions, but pure consciousness. When that is the seeker, you can't go in by imagination. Therefore, a large number of paths, which we consider as the secret paths for God realization based upon the use of the spaces that we create through imagination, are also not the paths to God realization, but the secret God who is hiding himself inside the seeker. We have to still find the path that takes us inside ourselves to the secret God who is hiding there. We can, of course, go on discovering the limitations of our practice the limitations of our method of God realization. I have drawn you from one level of God realization to another and brought you pretty close to where he is hiding, but you can't see him, you can't find him because you are outside of that single dot of consciousness. How can God be hiding in that little dot of consciousness and we can't find him? Of course we can find him, but you need the secret path. Now what is the secret path? If I tell you openly, it will be no longer secret. I can only indicate to you that the secret path to God realization exists and I can tell you how it operates. It operates by God himself operating from that single dot which we call the self. It operates by God himself being the seeker. It operates by God not allowing himself to be realized but realizing himself. God realization is God's own realization if you want to find the secret path to God realization. The ultimate form of consciousness, which is God himself, which is concealed in that dot, is what realizes itself. So the realization, the game of secret God realization, takes place within the consciousness and it takes place by that consciousness, the seeker becoming God himself. Not becoming. The word is wrong. I am using it to bring us up to that concept. If individuated consciousness in a single geometrical dot form within which there is no space to look for, within which you cannot go by any means of imagination, mechanical meditation or any other method, if that individuated form of consciousness has to experience its reality hiding within itself, it has to become that reality by itself. If that individuated soul, the consciousness of human beings, becomes the consciousness of God, that is called God realization. But does, does it mean that till it becomes God, it is not God? Where was God where it did not become God? How can a soul become God? What was God doing in the meanwhile? How can this one little thing expand to God, Godhood and then say, I have become God, as if there was no God before this became God? That doesn't make sense. Indeed, that is not true. God has always been there. God is there everywhere. In fact, nothing else existed except God. Ah, that's the secret. Nothing else existed except God. That's the secret. The secret statement is this. Nothing else has ever existed except God. Therefore, a seeker finding God is like God setting up an illusion and ending it. He's always been there. It's God's illusion which he sets up and ends. Therefore, you do not, this, the, that little dot of consciousness does not become God. It is always God, but the illusion it is not God, put up by God, is ceased by the will of God. That illusion ends by the will of God. Some people think that soul, human individual soul, is like a drop of water from the ocean, separated from God, now seeking to go back to the big ocean, which is God. This example is very fallacious. It doesn't do justice to God at all. That we are little drops of consciousness from the grand ocean which we call God. Now we have to go and find God and merge in it. For one thing, even if one dot, dot drop of water, if one little speck of water is taken out of the ocean, the ocean does not remain total ocean, so it can't be God. If one soul is taken out of God, the rest is not God. God, God is supposed to be total. There is nothing outside of God. Nothing else exists except God. Therefore, even if one little speck of consciousness goes out of God, God ceases to exist. And since God can't cease to exist, He has always been there. Nothing else has been there. Therefore, nothing ever goes out of God. 
Nothing ever leaves God. Everything is in God. All the time. Now, if everything is in the God, then what would be an appropriate simile to use? Going back to the ocean simile, God would be then like a total ocean where all the water is there. There is no water outside that ocean. And what is an ocean consist of? If all the water is in the ocean, what does it consist of? Drops of water. The drop doesn't have to leave the ocean to become a drop. If we were to sit and watch the ocean as a collection of drops of water, you can see the drops right in the ocean. What size of drops are they? Are they big or small? What size? They are of the size of the awareness of the drop. When we say the drop is this size, it is this size. When we expand the drop, it's this size. When we expand it further, it's the total ocean. It's the same drop. The sacred principle of one God is not violated. If we understand that human consciousness, the seeker, is not a drop of that ocean away from the ocean, but is within the ocean. Why it has become a drop is because of the use of awareness, to restrict awareness for that game, for that play, to that drop. To not only drop, to the size of the drop. If awareness is restricted to a limited size, it becomes a drop. If that restriction of awareness is removed without anything changing, it becomes the ocean. In between, you can also have stages of a small drop becoming a big drop, big drop becoming a very big drop, very big drop becoming a still bigger drop, still bigger drop becoming the ocean. But the ocean has not been disturbed. It has always been the ocean, always total. All drops were in it of all sizes. What created the drops was the game of awareness, not of separation. No human soul was ever separated from God. People sometimes ask me, one of the guys present here to, uh, from Minneapolis asked me 17 years ago, I spoke at the church in Minneapolis in 1963, and he asked me this question, I remember. I remember because he wrote a letter to me in India after that. He asked me this question, if we have now to go back to the home of the God, why did we leave it in the first instance? And my answer is, we never left it. We lost the consciousness of it. That's the whole point. This is the secret, that we have not to go anywhere to have the experience of totality. The totality exists all the time. The game of awareness within totality creates the individual, creates the seeker. Not the individual, the seeker. The individual is an illusion. Oneness is established by the totality. If it is total, it has to be one. Oneness is not established by separateness. You can't say you have oneness if there is not totalness. Totality alone makes for oneness. You can have no oneness unless there is total. If there is total, there is nothing else. Therefore, it is one. There has always been only one. It has always been total. That is God. The seeker is the individuated awareness of God. God finding himself. Why? How? By this game of awareness by which he becomes a seeker. And we get the experience of the self in all the covers of illusion, like the body, the senses, and the mind. These covers are placed upon that basic illusion of individuation. In order to keep the game really secret, it has become so secret that one can go around searching for God in the most secret way and never find it. Therefore, the secret path to God realization consists of removing the veil of individuation in awareness. When awareness expands to its own totality, it is God realization. I will speak of the methodology as we go along, how it is done, how it practically affects us. The practical side of it, I'm giving you the concept, the practical side of it, how we start working on this. I'll go on as we develop the subject further. But right now, I want you to really fully grasp this concept that in truth, we are not our covers, the body, the senses, and the mind. This is not this is not consciousness, this is not the seeker. This is not none of these is the seeker. The seeker of God who feels lonely, loneliness is the state of seeking. One wouldn't feel lonely if one was not seeking. And one cannot be a seeker if one is not lonely. Intense loneliness is the state of preparation to be a seeker. How do you know a, a, a person is a seeker? Just because he runs around for God, he may be running around for the ego. He may be running around just to satisfy his ego, his mind. How do you know a seeker? What is the sign, characteristic of a seeker who is finding God? The characteristic is the feeling of intense loneliness. Intense loneliness, being constricted to loneliness. 
that feeling that comes unexplained, intuitively, cannot be rationalized. That intense feeling of loneliness within is in all seekers. And the more the seeking, the more that feeling of intense loneliness. There is no explanation for it. Everything is around you. Good family, good home, money, company, people, social life, traveling all over the world, everything. You have everything to see around you and yet you feel lonely. What is making you that lonely self? The seeking. Therefore, the intense loneliness within is not in the body. It's not the body that is feeling lonely. Because the body can have company and be lonely. You can be lonely. Your body can have company and you can be lonely. It is not the senses. The sense perception can have the whole world to enjoy and yet you will be lonely. You can have everything that your eyes and ears and taste and touch and smell, smell can gather. You will still be lonely. It is not the mind. The mind can keep on thinking and can think out everything it has to think. Still you are lonely. The mind can create company of ideas, ideals, ideals of service, ideals of unselfishness, ideals of great philanthropy to create company of ideas. The mind can create all these ideas and still you are lonely. You can try it out. What I am suggesting is if you are really seeker of God, you will find that the loneliness will persist in spite of all the company you give to the body, the senses and your mind. The intense loneliness is in your soul, your spirit. It is in that restricted awareness form of God himself. The intense loneliness is in God himself, not in the covers we are wearing, not in the game that he is playing. The intense loneliness arises from consciousness itself. The totality of consciousness is God. The individuated consciousness is the seeker. When the individuation disappears and totality is experienced, it is called God-realization.